And here is our plan. So yesterday we will uh, cover the part one for how to construct decision tree. And part two is the, uh, so uh, let's start with a, a quick recap of yesterday's. And the decision trees were really quite popular in nineties, and but uh, some somewhat uh, went unpopular uh, at, uh, after the two thousands. And uh, but still, it's a uh, quite popular. And uh, because of the, it has a, a number of good uh, requirement or number of good properties, and uh, it can handle the uh, naturally. Uh, categor uh, categorical data and numerical data, and uh, it has a specific algorithm to uh, handle the missing values, and it's uh, robust to outliers, and uh, it's uh, in in sensitive to any uh, preprocessing like uh, monotone transformation, and uh, it's very uh, fast, and uh, it's uh, I don't know, uh, it can handle, but uh, here yeah, it, it's uh, interpolable. It's about uh, it's a middle score but and uh, but uh, they have a uh, big problems and the first one is uh, this one so uh, predict predict uh, performance is uh, uh, not that good compared with the uh, state of the art after the 2000s like a neural network or a uh, vector machines and also it is uh, very uh, not good at handling uh, uh, like a standard standard uh, data set like uh, for uh, linear regressions. So, and uh, today uh, I will, I want to start with uh, this advantage. So downside of the decision tree uh, learning algorithms. And uh, first of all, first of all, the, the one of the very clear thing is a uh, uh, decision tree boundary here is a uh, non-smooth. So, which means these are uh, decision tree ensemble uh, I will cover today, but the, this one is a, a decision boundary of uh, uh, decision trees, and it's uh, quite uh, non smooth So because of these uh, limitations, the predictive power is uh, uh, limited. So that's why the, like uh, SVM on your network is uh, uh, have a, a better prediction performance at that moment. So that's why uh, the decision tree, uh, the, these algorithms is pretty far after the 90s uh, than the decision trees. And uh, also, for example, it's a very, a very clear example is if we fit the regression tree on the line. So if we can just apply the linear regression, then it's very easy. But if we uh, use the uh, classification tree instead, then the, it's, it required many trees, so many leaves. So we need a very deep trees to uh, represent the just linear one line. So because of the uh, classification trees or decision trees boundaries are non -thermous. So, but uh, first point is that this downside, this drawback uh, can be uh, compensated by the ensemble learning. So that's why the ensemble learning comes in to the, uh, this context. So, and uh, the down, second downside is uh, actually, uh, I, was, uh, I said that decision trees is a very uh, easy to interpret, so and we can operate uh, intuitively, but the, it, has the, uh, it has a big issue about the uh, mechanism because uh, uh, it's, it is unstable. Uh, unstable means that uh, if we if we uh, if we training data sets changes a little bit, then the uh, constructed decision trees uh, changes uh, drastically. So, so then this is uh, some data set. Now this is uh, basically random uh, 90 hundred percent subsample over this one. So uh, for human eyes, uh, distribution is very similar. So uh, decision trees constructed. Uh, should be similar, but uh, it turns out the uh, constructed partitions, I mean, this corresponds to the tree structure and uh, it's very different. So if we can have a, a if same rule, then it, it is actually interpretable. But the, if we 
uh, change the, for, for example, few sample in the training set a little bit, then the that if then rule changes drastically. So in this sense, the, this interpretability is not so uh, practical. I mean, the, not that reliable because uh, yeah, it's not uh, not good for any uh, little bit uh, random per perturbation. And uh, then this is uh, what the this is a basically problem of uh, bias variance trade off. It's uh, one of the central problem in uh, super supervised machine learning, and the uh, theory uh, says that we cannot reduce both bias and the uh, variances. And uh, this is a this is a mm, this is the images. So basically, the uh, decision tree is a uh, kind of a. Uh, uh, classify or kind of uh, uh, learners with, with uh, low bias, but high variance, which means uh, uh, in on average, the, it will, uh, the prediction value will be a form good, but the, it changes the, uh, largely with the uh, little perturbation on the training data set. So that's why the, uh, this is a big issue if we uh, use the decision tree algorithm in practical situations. So, but again, this, uh, this this advantage can be compensated by uh, ensemble learning. And another thing is that not directly related to the ensemble learning, but the uh, decision tree has a two uh, other problems. The one is the data fragmentation, other is a, a bias in spectral selection. And the, for the first one, the data fragmentation, basically a decision tree is a, repeating the uh, splitting uh, given sample into the two groups. So if we repeat uh, this recursion too much, then the final area includes very small sample, like uh, two or three or something. So it's uh, not like the statistics, right? So decision based on the three example is uh, not that reliable. And uh, of course we can safeguard uh, this uh, recursion by the some option like uh, we, will, we, we can set the minimum sample of uh, a minimum sample in each if, but the, uh, this is a, a essential problem that decision tree algorithm have. So uh, this is a one of the uh, other problem. And the other one is a more uh, technical, but the uh, decision tree is repeating the pick up the one variables amongst the available variables. But this selection has some uh, strange bias, like a variable with the large number of categories, like a variable representing a, a country name or something. It has uh, many variations. And the other variables is like, a, I'm not sure, so female or men or something. Then the decision tree algorithm always uh, tend to select the country name because uh, that's more flexible. We can. Uh, pick uh, any country, specific country, we can more finer uh, partitions. That's why the, this is sometimes uh, problematic. But anyway, the, this is a uh, uh, decision trees uh, have this kind of problem. So that's why the, it is a uh, little bit uh, harder, harder to uh, effectively use in the practical situations. So, and uh, this is a, this is a, like a commentary, <laughs> but the, due to this downsize, especially the uh, instability and uh, non-smoothness. And then the, I would a little bit uh, cover the, this kind of uh, some straightforward extension, but the, these algorithms won't work in practice. So it's, this, is, this is a regression tree. And the, if we uh, replace the con constant prediction that leaf node by the linear regression, but it's still, uh, non-smooth and it's still unstable. So they share the disadvantages. And also we can even uh, have uh, uh, another another algorithm, well-known algorithm called MAS. The MAS is actually not true. It's uh, repeating the bending uh, bending curves and the fitting uh, to the points. But uh, the entire framework is very similar to this entry, but it's still uh, unstable and non-smooth. And also we can uh, change this, this axis power uh, splitting with the, some more linear splitting. 
but it's still non-smooth and it's, it's instable. So if we change a little bit sample, then this boundary changes uh, uh, large, largely. So anyway, uh, this is uh, some quick history and disadvantage of uh, uh, single decision tree learning algorithms. And that's why uh, uh, the technique called ensemble learning comes into this context. So we will uh, start with the, what is the ensemble learning. So, but uh, in principle, it's very uh, simple. So just predicting by multiple different models rather than the single model. So this is a, some single operation situation. If we build a, one neural network, and they make a prediction. Instead of the, the building a one uh, neural network model, if we have, a, a, for example, K uh, neural network with the different initial values and then uh, make prediction, but uh, we have a K different prediction, then we need some uh, good way to make a, a consensus. But uh, anyway, for example, just averaging out uh, all the predicted value and the output as a final prediction, then it uh, works. So that's the idea of uh, ensemble learning. <clears throat> so uh, the word ensemble is uh, probably from, from French, I think, and it's uh, just set in the original word, but the here ensemble is uh, as in the a musical ensemble. So <laughs> combining the different parts will be the sort of better, better ball. So uh, this is the ensemble learning. And uh, basically I won't go into the uh, general ensemble learning uh, algorithms, but uh, quickly we uh, cover the several typical situations. The first one is uh, I think uh, most intuitive. So uh, basically we train the different algorithms like a neural network and the SVM and random forest. We have a three model and uh, feed the same data sets and uh, integrate it. For example, averaging the, uh, the each prediction into the single prediction. This is the uh, voting and averaging. The second one is, uh, for example, for a neural network, it depends on the random initial values. So if we change the random read, the initial, uh, initial values, then the final model will be a little bit different. So uh, for, for example, if we train the five neural network with the same structure, but uh, with the different random initial values, then we have five different models. So we can do the same thing. So uh, integrating by voting and uh, averaging to make a final prediction. And that's the second one. And the remaining two is a little bit specific but uh, it's a, something typical for deep learning. It's called snapshot assembling. So for your network, you are training in the iteration. So for example, in your first code, in it's a uh, 20 epoch or so, you are iterating the, uh, updating the weight of uh, your network. And it, if it's converged, you can uh, fluctuate after the final solution. Uh, by the little bit uh, changing the uh, learning rate. So uh, it's uh, it's uh, <laughs> moving around some local optimum solutions. Then we can uh, we can take a snapshot during that process. And then we have, if we can take uh, multiple snapshots, then we have uh, multiple different models. So we can do the same thing. It's called uh, snapshot ensembling. And the actual PyTorch have uh, some specific utility uh, it's called a stochastic uh, uh, weight and averaging, but th that's uh, for deep learning. So I will uh, skip the details. The final one is uh, called stacking. And uh, as I said, if we have a multiple prediction, we, uh, we need to uh, integrate these different uh, prediction for the single target. But the, we, can, we can consider this problem as another supervised training. So, a different models output can be input to the different model. So if we make a prediction and then we, we can have a, for same sample, we, we have a different multiple prediction, then we can feed this feature. So it's a predicted values, a predicted, uh, we have a multiple predicted values. It can be feed into the another machine learning algorithms that is called stacking. So it's a very strong ensemble in techniques. But anyway, uh, this kind of technique is how to, uh, the example on the how to how to make a uh, how to integrate the multiple predictions. So, but anyway, the, 
uh, the method we will cover is uh, uh, this is the basically the ensemble learning uh, method module in the circuit learn. And uh, here is uh, some API list. And uh, we can see that many algorithms. But uh, we will cover the basically bagging access trees, gradient boosting uh, trees, and the random forest and the gradient boosting, another type of gradient boosted trees. And uh, uh, basically, other one is a stacking, boarding, or unsupervised learning for uh, by trees. And uh, but the, I will make uh, I will make a small quick note on the I will skip the Ada boost. So first one, uh, due to it's a, a very uh, famous algorithm, and uh, probably I think every every textbook covers that uh, Ada boost. But it's a historically and theoretically important algorithm. But uh, uh, in practical in practice. Uh, Basically, gradient, uh, gradient boosted tree is a more flexible uh, alternative to it. So uh, I will skip that today. But it's a, it's a, in short, it's a, a less hyperparameters and the user friendly in some sense, and it works uh, well in practice. But the, if we know the which hyperparameter uh, is important in the gradient boosted trees, then probably we can make a more flexible. Uh, module building using the uh, gradient boosted trees. So anyway, uh, this is a brief uh, list of the algorithms. So uh, we will start with the uh, standard algorithms. So which is uh, a random forest on one side and a gradient boosted tree on the on side, uh, outside. So it's uh, called a boosting and bagging uh, directions. So uh, let's make sure that uh, what we need here. So we have a single data set, but we need the multiple model. So then the, we, we have some, we, we need some way, certain way to generate uh, multiple different models from the same data set. So uh, then the, uh, roughly speaking, we have uh, two uh, different strategies. The first one is I will call the randomized type it's uh, called a bagging or random forest. And another one is an uh, optimized type. It's uh, called boosting. <laughs> the, the idea is uh, both simple, but very different. The first one is that uh, we need to uh, generate uh, multiple decision trees. Then we need some uh, random numbers. So then the use of randomness into, for example, we, if we can just resample from the training data sets, so move out 10% of the sample, and then we can change it a little bit different training data sets and uh, learn the decision tree on each set. Then we have uh, multiple different decision trees. And that is called a uh, randomized type uh, approach. And the other one is uh, basically we want to build first trees and then make a prediction. Then the, we, are, uh, we generate the second tree to compensate the uh, disadvantage of the first model. So we repeat this one. So adding a decision tree one by one to improve the, improve the prediction accuracy of the entire ensemble. Okay, this is our optimized type. So in the first quick look of, of the uh, decision boundary of the uh, tree ensemble algorithms, the, this is a, a decision tree classifier with the max steps one, which means that it's a, a decision stamp. And the, this is a typical decision tree classifier in the middle uh, model complexity. And the last one is uh, very deep trees, which is uh, uh, basically fully grown tree with the zero training error. But this is a very, I don't know, uh, jagged boundary. And uh, these three are uh, typical uh, tree ensemble algorithms. And uh, it's the uh, boundary, classification boundary is somehow uh, smooth. It's not smooth, but uh, better than this one. So that's uh, uh, the visual effect of uh, ensembling. It's a kind of a smoothing, smoothing out the, these kind of uh, bumpy, I don't know, uh, boundaries. So, and the basic strategy uh, the, for the, uh, both strategies is that basically uh, we are just add multiple trees. So uh, this is a just very, abstract images of a uh, uh, tree ensemble. So we have a uh, different uh, decision trees 
Now we can multiply some numbers. Now we, we can take the average of all of the trees, something like this one. So, but uh, we need to make sure. So what does adding decision tree mean? So this is our starting point. And for uh, classification, so as, uh, as I explained yesterday, uh, each uh, classification tree is a kind of a, a surface. So it's a history, a histogram bar, the 3D bar graph, like, a, and then it has a, every point have the have the heights. So in this sense, we can just uh, sum up all of the or take the average of uh, each height for each point. Then we can uh, have the uh, additive uh, ensembles. But this is uh, basically strategy for uh, classification pro uh, problem. So we just uh, represent each decision uh, trees by a probability, class probability. And the class probabilities are just numbers between one and one zero. Then we can just sum up the, uh, these probabilities or just take, in, take, up, take an average all of all of our decision trees probability. So in the, some notes here is, uh, uh, in this example, I, I set the number of partitions. So in other words, uh, number of, uh, leaf nodes up to four, then each uh, partition consists of the four, four different regions. But the, after taking average, the uh, partition is the more finer because uh, this uh, partition is uh, overlapped in complex, complex, complicated way. So uh, that's why this, uh, this outcome surface is more smooth uh, than the before adding. So this is for uh, classification. And for regression, it's, it's very trivial. Regression is uh, just predicting numbers. So we are just adding or taking an average of uh, all of our predicted values. So it's a uh, uh, additive ensemble for uh, regressions. So this is a, a very basic strategy to how to make the uh, consensus uh, final prediction. So, then the, we will uh, we will cover the how a randomized type and the optimized type uh, works visually, and the first one is the, the randomized type, and then here uh, we generate multiple classification tree by changing the self sample randomly. So if we do some bootstrapping, then the training sample is a little bit changed, then the uh, in result in the different uh, classification uh, trees. Then uh, if we uh, take average of this one, then we can have a smooth uh, outcome. This is a, a random forest regressors, basically. And also uh, here, uh, we can take uh, different algorithms, but uh, basically uh, works in the same way. And uh, we have a multiple, but a little bit close uh, decision trees, then take the average of uh, these uh, curves, then we, are, we have a uh, smooth output. And uh, we have a more uh, flexible uh, changes in uh, curve shapes. And this is the uh, randomized type. So and, uh, in contrast, the, the optimized type is uh, very different. Uh, we can start with the constant prediction, which means they're always returning the average of uh, y values in the training data set. And then uh, we uh, generate some tree and uh, a little bit change and add up to the original constant prediction and we change the constant prediction a little bit. And then we repeat this one until the curve have uh, enough uh, flexibility or uh, representation, representation capability. So this is uh, basically uh, uh, optimized type uh, ensemble. But anyway, the, each iteration, we just uh, add one tree, so uh, one by one, and then uh, change it to curve a little bit. So, so uh, for uh, wrap up from now, it's uh, two huge strategies, uh, two basic strategies. And the one is randomized type, and the one is uh, another is uh, optimized type. And the, a basic idea for randomized type is that it's a kind of a smoothing of uh, overfitted trees. So base tree needs to be sort of overfitted. 
So, but the, if you have a many over 53 and the take, uh, take average of all of it, it uh, goes in the good, good form. That's uh, the idea of a randomized type. So uh, base three should be large and overfitted. It means uh, in the usual, so default parameter of uh, scikit learn is uh, max, uh, no limit for max depth, which means uh, uh, scikit trees run the forest or extra trees are always, uh, gen always generated stuff. A zero training error big trees or deep trees. And uh, but the yeah, it's it should be overfitted, but if we uh, generate many trees and uh, take average of uh, uh, predictions, then the, the final outcome behave well. So that's the first idea. And the second one is the uh, very opposite direction. So base three should be very small, so limited uh, flexibility. And uh, because of the due to that we are limiting the uh, degree of a freedom of a base tree, then the one tree is not enough. So it's uh, always uh, underfit. But if we add up to the another very small tree and repeating this addition, then uh, we, can, we can make a, a good prediction by the entire, uh, the entire ensemble of uh, such small trees. So, uh, in this case, in contrast to the random case, so each base three should be small, and uh, also it should be sort of underfitted. It's uh, technically called weak learner. So weak means uh, it's uh, had uh, have a limited prediction performance because the, it's uh, underfitted. So and uh, actually, the <clears throat> scikit learns default values. For example, for a gradient boosted regressor, so it, it limited the max steps equals to three. So it's uh, only we we are only allowed to uh, maximum up to three iteration of the recursion. It's not very uh, short trees, and also for uh, LGBM uh, regressor, it's uh, limited the number of partitions. So we allowed up to thirty one partitions, or in other words, we allowed. Uh, uh, gener to generate leaves up to 31. So end node should be there. Number of the end, the end, end, end node uh, have the maximum values. So this is a uh, wrap up for now. And then we are more going into more details. But uh, before that, uh, you might think that we can somehow do both or we can, we can somehow integrate the both approach the actually the, the answer is yes. So uh, for Clint's uh, implementation of the optimized type, I will say the gradient boosted algorithms uh, can also use the, a randomized strategy. So during the optimization, so adding three one by one, then we can also uh, put perturbation on there, for example, the sub sample or something. So we can do both. It's called a, a stochastic gradient boosting, but the, it's a kind of a straightforward mix mix up for the to approach. So basic idea is a two different direction, the randomized type and the optimized type. So we will first <coughs> uh, focus on the first type, randomized type. And that basically, I think in the last week, you, uh, you uh, heard this idea of uh, bootstrapping from the lecture. And then I will uh, just uh, brief uh, recap for this one, but Anyway, the, uh, what we want to do is uh, reduce the prediction uh, variances. So we have uh, many different over 53 in each difference, but if we take the average of it, uh, the middle average will be very good, uh, good uh, can be very good prediction. So for example, in this case, uh, uh, for a normal distribution case, if we take 10 sample, and uh, take the average of it, then the uh, distribution of uh, this average value will be, we have the uh, smaller variances. It's actually the variances that are actually reduced to uh, one tenth. So if we uh, sample is uh, all independent, so we can add up the 10 different outputs, then the variance uh, can be reduced to 10, uh, one tenth. So it looks very good. So this is the this is the idea behind uh, uh, algorithm called uh, bagging. It's a uh, abbreviation 
on the bootstrap aggregating. It's very simple. So we have a we have our training example and do bootstrap. So if we applied one bootstrap, then we can have a different subsample and a training uh, decision tree on each uh, random subsample and then uh, take it average. So it's a, a bagging, cold bagging. So then, for example, this is a, a overfitted tree, uh, default uh, decision tree classifier. But if we uh, generate five tree, then uh, looks a little bit better. If we take 10 trees, then looks far, looks better, better, better. And this one is uh, we need the 500 trees. But anyway, if we generate it, the uh, bootstrap sample and a train on train decision tree on it, and then we can generate uh, multiple different trees and then just take the average of the output. So it's a bagging. And it looks good so far, but it has a and as a problem. So uh, because the bagging is very good uh, algorithms, but has it has some limitation because uh, uh, the effect of bagging is the highest when uh, each, each base tree is uh, independent. So as I said in the bootstrap sample, if sample as independent, uh, independently identically distributed, then we can reduce the variance to the, for example, uh, one tenth if we have a ten sample, but uh, here is the same theory. So if if the same variable have a, a variance of a sigma squared, and uh, but uh, correlate, uh, correlated at the, uh, somehow correlated, then uh, independent case we can uh, that variance can be reduced uh, b over one. But uh, if we correlate it, then the effect is. Uh, uh, so very small. So if there is a no correlation between the variables, it works. But uh, so let's uh, look back at our bagging strategy. So take a bootstrap sample and a decision tree training on it, which means that probably that decision tree will be somehow very similar. So it's uh, output prediction will be uh, correlated. So just bagging is uh, not enough. Uh, to have a good uh, prediction capability. So, so the lesson from this uh, fact is that uh, first, we need to make the tree somehow dissimilar as possible. I mean, the like our independence prediction, but at the same time, we need the each tree needs uh, have a small training error. Random trees are just chaos. So it's a very dissimilar trees, but each tree should be very uh, good predictors. So this is a very, this is a, a requirement for us. And the uh, first answer is uh, used uh, in, uh, in addition to the uh, bootstrapping, which, which is a subsampling of a data set. Uh, we apply the same same thing to the features, the variables. So we can just uh, subsample the feature. For example, if we have uh, ten features. Some trees uh, can only use the random five of the five variables, and another tree can use the another random five five variables. And there's something like that. Probably uh, outcome decision tree will be very dissimilar because uh, the two tree can be used to different feature sets. And that's why uh, this is called a random subspace method, and uh, it's uh, developed in the, the end of the nineties. And also we can do. Uh, this is the only the randomized feature and then taking average. And but we can do both. So we can do bagging or the subsampling plus a subsampling, subsampling of the samples and the subsampling of the features. Uh, do the both at uh, uh, the same time. So this is uh, called random patch method. And this works well, but uh, it's somehow uh, limited. And the final answer is the uh, random forest. The random forest is a more uh, detailed algorithm, so I will explain. But uh, it's a little bit variation of uh, a random subspace and the random patch method. And uh, for each, uh, we need to uh, uh, train a decision tree. What we need is uh, uh, the the good way to find a good split for each variables, and then we refocus on that procedure. So first one is we select a uh, 
a random subset of variable when we uh, when we uh, need to uh, do a best split search. So every uh, layers we uh, do these uh, three steps. The first one is that we just take a random uh, subset of the features. In this case, we just pick up the uh, variable two, variable four, solely for this is Japanese, so the variable two and uh, variable four, and then uh, ignore the unsampled uh, features and then just take the, uh, for just search for best splits in the selected uh, features. And then, so in this case, the one of which, then and, uh, we can just take the better one. This is, uh, and if we repeat this uh, process recursively, and then we have uh, uh, each base three, but it's very different because uh, each, uh, each recursion uh, uses a different feature subset. And also <coughs> uh, a random forest also uses a bagging, which means that each base three is trained on the different subset. So it's, it's quite randomized situation. Then the, we can make a generated tree as uh, very dissimilar. Uh, with this idea. So that's uh, how random forests work. So the point is that uh, if we do very uh, hard constraints on the learning, but the decision, uh, decision tree algorithm is uh, from the definition, if we allow a very deeper tree, then uh, we can achieve the uh, low training error anyway. Because uh, if, we, uh, if we partition the given training data sets, into the, for example, uh, one, one data point in the one uh, partitions, then it should be correct. So uh, this is the point. So it, we put a very hard condition by uh, randomization, but it's still decision tree algorithm. So we can have a zero training error base three, but uh, a very dissimilar set of uh, uh, trees. So, and uh, it, so in this sense, this is uh, effective for when we have uh, multiple variables. If we have, uh, for example, two or three variables, so if your data sets have uh, only three variables, so using a random forest is not a good idea. But if, we, if you have uh, 20 or 100 or more, then random, for, random forest works very well because of uh, this uh, mechanism. And uh, also a little bit uh, note here is uh, in the, original implementation and also in the scikit-learn implementation, uh, self-sampling of a uh, data points, it'll be uh, sampling, with, uh, uh, sampling with replacement, it's a uh, bugging, right? But uh, if we uh, sample the features, it's, uh, we will use the sampling with our replacement. So, a little bit uh, different strategy for sampling, but anyway, this is a uh, random forest. So uh, for simple tuning of the, this algorithm, it's the basically uh, two major parameters. The one is uh, how many number of trees to be generated. It's a very simple. This this, this parameter share uh, is uh, shared all of the tree ensemble. We need to multiple decision trees. So in the another one is a number of features to be selected. So max features. And the typical standard choice is a root of a number of features. This is the original proposal. And also log of a feature, if we have uh, too many numbers of uh, features. And then the, we have a, a number of feature itself. And the but point is that if we set number of features here to the max features, we, we will use the sampling without replacement, which means that if we set uh, if we take this option, then the, it's, there is, uh, we do not, do not use the feature subsampling. And uh, interestingly, this is a site that learns a regression default parameters. So uh, random forest classifier for classification default parameter is this one, as the proposed in the original paper. But for regression, interestingly, uh, default setting is this one. So there is no feature subset. Because the probably, I think, uh, without any uh, feature subset, uh, regression have a more freedom. So naturally, the uh, outcome decision tree is uh, uh, dissimilar. So this is uh, uh, in the working of a uh, uh, random forest algorithm. And uh, from the 
from the computer science viewpoint, a random forest crash fire is known to be very similar property of the nearest neighbor regressions. And there is a very famous paper. And uh, theoretically, uh, we can see the random forest algorithm as the some adaptive variants of our nearest neighbor algorithms. So, but th this is uh, some notes. And the fourth method is the uh, extra trees, uh, the algorithm I like. And uh, this is uh, some small variation of uh, random forest, but it's a uh, very interesting algorithm, I would say. So, but uh, again, algorithm is very simple and uh, almost same as the uh, uh, random forest. So we are first thing for every uh, splitting search, we first uh, restrict, uh, re uh, select a random subset of the features. And then in the original random forest, we do the straightforward best split search here, which means that evaluates the, uh, the impurity score of, of the, at the all possible splitting points. But instead of this uh, exact search, uh, they are very, their uh, extra trees takes a very sloppy uh, strategies. Just, just take a random split somewhere in between the data ranges for each samples and take the good one as a last uh, point. So it's more extremely randomized. But as I said before, it's a decision tree. So if we allow a very deeper tree, so then we can get a very small training error. So that's why this kind of uh, very sloppy uh, strategy still works uh, to diversify the final shape of a generated tree. But this is our uh, extra tree algorithm. And uh, actually this simple idea works very interestingly. So I was uh, covered some very interesting property of your extra trees. And uh, basically it's very uh, simple algorithm. So almost same as a random forest, but instead of the exact best split search, uh, they just uh, take random split. That's it. But uh, basically, the most computationally hard points for uh, decision tree learning is uh, trying to find the best bit because uh, we have uh, many features, we have uh, many uh, samples, then we have a, a very large number of possible split points. And uh, we need to calculate the splitting uh, scores for each uh, every, every possible split. And then if we have a large number sample, we have a large number of uh, variables. So computation time for that process takes a uh, uh, large time. But if we can just sample one split for each variables, it's extremely fast. So it's a very fast version of a random tree, a random forest. And the second point is uh, also we introduce a very uh, random uh, constraint on the uh, for the split, then that the generated tree are more dissimilar compared with the random forest. Then it is very good in terms of a theory. So if we uh, trees are uncorrelated, the effect of bugging, the so effect of uh, redu uh, variance reduction is uh, uh, maximized. So in this sense, it's a prediction accuracy is uh, very high. Uh, in typical case, it's uh, better than the original random forest algorithm. So here is it, especially for regression. I, I will cover the uh, why in the soon. And the, but the one note to, if we, if we want to use the uh, extra trees from the scikit learn implementation, this is a very, a co very uh, strong caution. And the default setting in uh, scikit learn is that uh, uh, bootstrap equals to false, which means that uh, uh, no bugging. So just, a random split and the random uh, subset features uh, selection. And uh, probably I think a random forest without bugging uh, does not make much sense, but the extra trees without bugging, which means uh, only randomized feature and split, and uh, is an extremely interesting algorithm uh, according to the some empirical evidence. So I will cover this one. So first interesting property is a uh, random forest is uh, basically we always use the bagging. So subset of a uh, training example. So that's why it's very almost impossible to overfit the entire data sets because uh, we own, what we can 
uh, access is always subset sub sub sample of the entire training data set, so it's very difficult. And they also we need to take average of uh, many different trees, so it also uh, main reason why the, the overfit by the, uh, random forest is very really hard. But uh, in some situation, in some special situation, we, well, if we want to the anyway, if we want to the train, training area low, then the random forest is not good choice because it cannot overfit. For, for example, for example uh, if we just memorize the all of the training data sets, then Sometimes it's okay, so there is no test set. And we just uh, want to build some prediction model on the data we have. In that case, the overfit is, is a not big problem. But in that case, the random forest is a kind of a smoothed version of a, a outcome. But uh, extra tree without bugging means uh, without bugging, so we can do overfitting. So basically, a base tree in the extra trees ensemble is always a very uh, overfitted. And plus, uh, they are very uh, completely different shaped uh, addition trees. But it with the uh, uh, training error zero because, as, uh, because it's a decision trees. So fully grown trees always have a uh, zero training error. And but uh, even that situation, so in standard machine learning sense, this is the overfitting and a prob problematic. But uh, there is a, some interesting phenomena in recent machine learning community. It's called harmless overfitting or benign overfitting. And typically this phenomena is uh, discussed in the deep learning algorithms. So if you have many data sets and uh, if, if we have a two uh, models and one is a very small training error and one is uh, somehow uh, do some regu uh, regularization, and then interestingly, uh, in many cases, uh, this overfit, so apparently overfitted tree also perform very well on the unseen test data set. It's a called a benign overfit. And uh, also that this uh, extra tree with, uh, without bagging show this uh, interesting phenomenon. And uh, so th that's why the uh, extra tree with bagging off uh, is the default of a, a <clears throat> in scikit line implementation, but more we can we can have a more uh, in, intuitive interpretation of this one. This is actually extra trees regressor without uh, bagging, so it's kind of a very flexible curve goes into the every uh, every training data points, but it's still somehow restricted. So if we do this with the uh, uh, polynomial regression, then the, it's a uh, Kind of messy uh, fluctuation, but if we uh, do some uh, extra tree regression, then it's still somehow acceptable, even if it's uh, overheated, because uh, these are all over training uh, cases, so it should be realized in some uh, situations. So the, this is a so and uh, another interesting property is. Uh, some sort of, uh, they, they can uh, produce some sort of a natural interpret, interpolation between the data points. So regression is a basically, we want to some uh, curves uh, go through the typical uh, data points. And uh, for example, let's, let's assume we have a, this kind of uh, data points and uh, somehow we want to fit some curve onto the, this one. And, uh, but, this point, this interval between the 15 and 20, there is a no data set. So we can, we can have a, we can justify any decision because there is no data. So it can be like this or like opposite. So in this sense, this is a, a extra trick regressor and this is a decision tree classifier. But this uh, no data area uh, interpolation is a very conservative. It's a, uh, anyway, it's a, uh, Average of some sub, some sub sample always, but if we use the another uh, continuous models, that's uh, some it somehow the groundless interpolation from the inductive bias inside the model. This is uh, looks good, but it's we are not sure because uh, there is no data. So and uh, this uh, property is 
also discussed in the original paper. And this is a figure from the original paper. So this is the uh, extra three algorithms. And I will a uh, little bit check the bagging or extra trees without bagging. And uh, for example, the random forest regressor here in the somehow this, this curve, but for this uh, no data regions, there is a somehow similar, just similar to the one uh, decision trees. But uh, for extra trees, due to the random split, it's a kind of, a, I don't know, pseudo linear interpolation between even there is no data sets. So it's, uh, this property works very well in the practice. So that's why extra tree algorithms works very well in the practical situations. So, and it's very first and it's, it has very interesting property, but the idea is very uh, simple with just one little modification on the original random forest algorithm. Anyway, this is our, our extra tree algorithms. And uh, the effect of a random split, uh, we can see the visually on the, uh, the generated partition of each base tree. So here we see the random forest uh, classifier, uh, random forest uh, ensemble. The, each one is a, a generated partition for each base tree. And the, each base tree is some, somehow the, depend on the same data set. So it's somehow, it's very different, but the, it's uh, have uh, some sort of similarity. But for extra trees, we just uh, split the randomly on the each uh, direction. So the, the partition is more diverse. So in the techniques ensemble, so mesh is finer uh, in the extra tree algorithms. So this is uh, uh, the idea of a, a randomized type uh, ensemble. And uh, actually, uh, you can use the other randomization, like a random, is, uh, instead of random step sample, you can apply the random rotation, random projection, or something like that. So anyway, if we randomize the data set and apply the decision tree, then we can, uh, we can have a nice uh, tree ensemble. And this is the story of our first strategy. So I called it randomized step. And then uh, <clears throat> I move on to the next strategy. It's uh, optimized type, so boosting. So uh, uh, any question for now? It's okay. Okay. So uh, as I said before, that uh, optimized type start with a very uh, naive prediction. In in this case, the constant prediction, just a returning. Yeah, you mean the, can we train in parallel of the decision? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's a, the subset selection is just random. So sometimes it's over, it has a overlap, but it has not. But the point is that each learning for each base three is basically independent from the other one. So if we have a multiple CPU, we can just distribute it, sir, uh, each digital tree algorithm to the CPU. In this case, we can, the uh, randomized type uh, tree ensemble is a very uh, good, have a very good fit for parallel processing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And the next one is optimized type. So we will uh, start with a constant prediction and we will uh, changing uh, uh, gradually by adding our small tree uh, one by one here. And uh, probably I think uh, this, this update formula, you, you can uh, think of the uh, deep learning uh, gradient descent. And actually this is a uh, gradient descent. Uh, this idea is, comes from the gradient descent. So uh, <clears throat> also gradient descent is a uh, very, uh, core components in the uh, deep learning algorithm. So uh, you, the, the, the lecture uh, in the last week covered this property, but uh, 
I will just uh, give a, a brief uh, recap visually. So what we want to do is uh, minimize some function here, and depending on the subparameter theta, and uh, if we take theta on each axis, this function is somehow like a complicated surface. And uh, minimizing loss function over this directly corresponds to finding some uh, local minimum or the smallest uh, values, I would say, and from the random start positions. This is uh, basically uh, the goal of the gradient descent. The gradient descent algorithm is a very simple algorithm. So we can start from somewhere randomly, let's say here, and then we can uh, move uh, move with theta a little bit towards the direction that reduces the value of a loss function. So here, if it goes down a little bit here, then the highest height of the surface is a little bit uh, improved. And then this is a basically the update formula of uh, gradient descent. And this is a, a learning, uh, learning rates here, just a small number. And Basically, we just iterate this process. So then, so look, uh, look around, <laughs> look around the surface, and then go to the, uh, go down to the uh, neighborhood. Then, yeah, then the, we can get the, finally we can get the, some minimum. And this is a uh, very brief view of a uh, gradient descent algorithm. But the problem is uh, how to choose this direction. So this is actually the gradient uh, comes from. So basically gradient vector is a uh, <clears throat> uh, partial deriv derivative values for each uh, parameters. And then uh, it theory guarantees that uh, if we move to the that direction uh, gradually, then we can reach to the uh, nearest local minimum. And this is our, our gradient descent algorithms. And uh, actually the partial derivative here is a change in the function value when each variable, each variable is uh, changed a little bit. So delta, you change the delta, then the function value changes a little bit. The, this function value is the height of the surface. So we, what we want to do is uh, we go steepest direction. So it's a gradient descent. And actually it's a direction of the normal vector of the ice surface, but anyway, it's a, it's a theory guarantee that if we just take the gradient direction, the repeat that simple iteration, then we can get them. Uh, we can we can minimize the any loss function. Okay, and uh, I will make some brief comments on how to compute this uh, derivative is uh, actually back propagation in the deep learning algorithm. So, deep learning function is a nested, very deeply nested function, and just uh, manually calculate the. Uh, derivative is very hard. So there is a invented, uh, uh, we invented some algorithmic, dif uh, algorithmic differentiation. That is uh, basically back all about back propagation. But for decision trees, we cannot apply the back propagation because the decision tree is uh, not a parametric algorithm. So then we need to use this knowledge by different direction. But anyway, the, this is a gradient descent. And uh, if we uh, minimize the loss function value, then we go to the negative direction. And if we uh, maximize the loss function, then we go to the gradient descent direction. But anyway, the important parameter here is uh, this one, this constant, and it's uh, called learning rate. It's a step size of uh, this update. So, and the uh, important thing is uh, if we uh, go really small step, then uh, it certainly uh, heads towards the nearest uh, local minimum, but it requires many iterations. So, but if we set the many very large uh, learning rates, so step size is very large, so it's a uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, number of iteration, it's go move uh, drastic, drastic, drastically, so it can advance significantly in the different direction with a few uh, iteration. But it's too coarse, and uh, probably uh, some some we have some risk to overshoot some very important uh, local minimum, and then we need to choose the good one <laughs> between these two extremes. So uh, even for the uh, deep learning case, uh, 
uh, learning rate setup is very critical, and also for a gradient descent uh, for uh, addition tree algorithms. But anyway, this is a, so this update formula uh, now looks like a gradient descent update, and then this delta should be somehow something like a gradient uh, vector. But it's actually, we are fitting the curves. So there is no clear answer for what this gradient means. So this is a basic idea of gradient descent, but the, it's very simple. So we start from the constant numbers <clears throat> and uh, we fit the sub trees and uh, we repeat that process again. And basically what we actually do is uh, uh, related to the gradient values. So if we fit the first tree here, or the some t iteration t point, let's let's assume we have a, this kind of a forest tree. So ensemble, uh, so the ensemble of the generated trees uh, until now, and then we can uh, compute the gradient value of uh, this uh, current forest. And uh, in this case, though, I mean the gradient just means a. Uh, with respect to the uh, loss loss function, so if we okay, uh, if we have a loss function like a, a squared error, then just uh, take a derivative of uh, that uh, loss function in, in terms of the predicted values, then some fixed function, then we just uh, substitute current value of uh, y i and the uh, prediction value for uh, of the current tree ensemble. And then that's a gradient value. So, oh, sorry. So let's say that these are a gradient value on the training uh, example. And then instead of the, this original data set, we fit the decision tree to the gradient sample values. And then we add to the, uh, the entire forest with the uh, multiplying the some small constants, so learning rate. This uh, this recursion is uh, basically the core component of gradient boosting, and uh, I, I think I, if you are unsure about this process, so uh, actually if we uh, if we just focus on the regression, so uh, least square regression loss function is something like that. So it's a squared error between the true value and the predicted values. Then the gradient is just this, uh, just a difference between the predicted value and the desired values. So just uh, if we fit the, some function and just compute the difference onto the, uh, that area and fit the regression tree over it. So the, this is a gradient boosted uh, trees. And then uh, repetition is a basically just uh, decision tree one by one at each iteration. And the, that's uh, base regression trees uh, better approximate the gradient sample values for each uh, training data set. And the, this, uh, this is uh, basically both used for classification and regression. So it means uh, even for the classification problem, we need a regression tree. So gra gradient vector is uh, always uh, numeric values. So we need uh, regression trees for uh, a classification problem. And also uh, mathematically speaking, this addition can be viewed as an approximate gradient descent in function space. But I will skip the details, but there is some theory. <laughs> and anyway, the, but this uh, idea uh, does not have uh, some widely commonly used name. So we have a uh, different aliases for this always. Gradient, gradient bo uh, tree boosting, gradient, gradient boosting machine or GBDT or Mart, TreeNet, any boost, but uh, all of these names uh, represent the same algorithm. So as we have said before. So I will <clears throat> cover the very standard implementation of these algorithms. Let's call the original uh, gradient boosting. And uh, I, would, I should uh, make some small comments. The gradient boosting itself uh, does not require decision trees. So we can use the other machine learning, any other machine learning al algorithms for base learner, but the most of the case uh, for now that we will use it decision trees because uh, it's a very good fit. So 
for example, we can we can apply a gradient boosting to deep learning or something, but it's a computationally hard and the uh, uh, prediction uh, improvement is very limited because the uh, uh, deep learning itself already have the very good performance. So assembling uh, all that strong uh, predictor is not that effective. So anyway, so this is a Friedman's original gradient boosting. It has a two small modification in the general framework. And the first one is, uh, I will, uh, I, uh, basically I skipped the, what kind of a uh, splitting criteria to be used for each base tree learning. And the original pro proposal, we use very specific uh, criteria called Friedman's MSC. And uh, I guess uh, scikit learns default is this one. But this is uh, somehow not theoretically guaranteed one more heuristic, heuristically proposed score. So uh, I'm not sure this is a good choice or not. So later I will speak about more general splitting criteria, but the original implementation used this heuristic uh, criteria. And the another one is, uh, I just said uh, uh, multiply some small constant and add it. So which means that we just are uh, changing the a height of the entire curve here, but actually we we, we have we, we have a, a regression tree, and the regression tree is a, a piecewise constant predictor, so we can adjust the constant for each region. So that is the original uh, proposal. Then the uh, addition is more flexible. We can optimize the uh, changes for each uh, region independently. So uh, and the typical loss function is uh, something like this one. So if we take the minimum square error, so gradient function is something like this, and so just the difference. And also if we take the maximum absolute error here, and uh, we just uh, need the sign of a difference. And if we uh, are, if we are solving classification, then this is a loss is a cross entropy probably you're using for uh, deep learning exercises. And then we can uh, get the, some uh, gradients for this one. So anyway, the MSE case uh, fit the trees and uh, calculate the difference between the predicted value and the uh, true values and uh, much brighter constant value and add it and uh, repeat that process. This is a a gradient boosted uh, regression trees. Okay, so the, this is a some technical parts, but I will explain a little bit. So, what the impurities to use in regression inside a gradient uh, boosted trees? So we need to fit some trees on the sam sample gradient values. So uh, we need to some uh, splitting criteria, and. Uh, <clears throat> The paper said that we, what we want to maximize is the sum loss function. So uh, over the training data set, sum up all over the training data set here. And uh, we are trying to adding this tree here and uh, want, to, want to minimize uh, by changing the tree shape. And what tree is the constant, a piecewise constant prediction, then we can separate cases in by partition. So if the X, belongs to some specific region, then this added value, so tree value is just constant. So we can just separate cases by each uh, partition. Then the formula like this one. And then this is uh, just an addition of a little uh, constant. Then the, we can just apply the quadratic Taylor approximation here. By the way, Taylor approximation is something like this one uh, from the uh, introductory, Calculus, but anyway, it's a very quite standard approximation. And then, then we have a, this function. So only this value is just a uh, current value of a uh, loss function. And then just we, we need to consider this added uh, fluctuation parts. And uh, if we tweak this, so what we want to minimize is uh, changing by this constant for each regions and uh, minimize this loss, loss function now, this is just a uh, quadratic polynomial with, with respect to uh, C, so each constant in each region. Then we can minimize by tweaking the C values 
And uh, it turns out the minimal value is something like this one. And then, then we just use this uh, minimum value for uh, impurity score. So this is the uh, final idea for uh, gradient boosted trees. So uh, let's uh, more uh, specifically, uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, uh, loss function and we want to minimize it. And then the impurity is uh, something like this one. So like a, a sum of the Hessian or the quadratic, the, the quadratic term coefficients and the, uh, the sum of the uh, first order derivative coefficients squared. And then uh, for splitting criteria, we need the uh, impurity improvements. And this is the impurity before split. And uh, after the split, we have uh, two different reasons. Then we need to take uh, average or just take sum. Then this is the impurity after split. So basically what we do is uh, uh, calculate this numeric value for every possible uh, split. And uh, this looks a little bit uh, complicated, but it's very simple because the GI and the HI, for example, is very easy, easy to calculate if we, if we know the, uh, the shape of the loss function. Just the first derivative and the second derivative. Okay, so this is the final implementation of a gradient versus tree. And uh, then the uh, X boost, uh, XG boost comes out. So XG boost, uh, in addition to this discussion, they added some regularization term here. So this this one is a basically CCP in the last week. So the up to uh, the, the maximum number of uh, uh, leaf nodes. But this is the uh, so-called uh, second order, so L2 regularization. And this is a so-called L1 regularization uh, induced some sparsity to the leaf nodes. And anyways, uh, we can uh, minimize this uh, loss function with a regularization penalty uh, by simply using the uh, tree ensemble. This is uh, called uh, XG boost algorithms. And, uh, but XG boost is uh, not the name of the algorithms. It's uh, more like a implementation or a library. So it comes with a very huge number of uh, engineering efforts to uh, for speed up or so parallelization, sparsity uh, usage or using a cache or every possible software engineering technique is in the, in the, uh, introduced. So it's quite fast implementation. And uh, uh, it's, uh, that's why it's uh, very uh, quite popular even before the paper is published. So it's, it's open source in the GitHub and every, every Kagura or every data scientist already know about how good it is. Then the, it is published in 2016, but I think uh, everyone knows about the two years before the, the paper published. So this is uh, actually boost algorithms. And also this comes with the option for uh, uh, randomized type in, in inclusion, like uh, doing uh, gradient, de a gradient, decent, gradient decent iteration, we can do the bagging. So for each iteration, uh, for calculating this score, we can just restrict it to the sum sum sample. And or we can restrict the uh, features for each iterations as in the random forest algorithm. So, and uh, actually the criteria a little bit changed. So uh, CCP goes here and uh, L2 regularization goes here and uh, L1 goes here or here. So, but anyway, it's a very close, uh, very straightforward calculation from the uh, previous discussion. So anyway, this is our XG boost and also the success of the XT boost algorithms from the Microsoft, it's called uh, like JBM. And uh, it's uh, from Microsoft, but it's open sourced and it's quite popular. And uh, basically uh, in this paper, it is introduced the leaf wise loss. And but this idea is now uh, widely applicable in the, even in the scikit learn or XG boost. So it's uh, not specific to this algorithm. So. Uh, the core component of this algorithm is, is a, a two uh, trick to uh, handle the more larger data sets and the more many features. So, and they, if your data set is a huge, then the light GBM is a very good choice because it's very fast. And uh, it's called uh, uh, 
technique of Gauss and the EFB. And uh, I will skip the detail, but uh, Gauss is uh, uh, skip some subsample based on some specified cross area. So if we have, a, I don't know, median samples, we can we can ignore some subsample without losing uh, prediction accuracy. And also we can do the same thing for the features. If we have a many uh, features, but some feature is uh, not so informative, so uh, we can we can skip that feature or we can ignore that features in very smart ways. So this is the uh, core algorithm so far by the GBM. So, but in but in short, it's really quite faster version of uh, uh, XG boost. And the XG boost is uh, have many options, so we can uh, customize as we like. So, and the, that's why it's uh, really quite popular in the uh, current data scientist. And in addition to the XG boost, it comes with the two uh, two additional tricks to to scale. Then the current data sets. For example, inside Microsoft, uh, the company like Microsoft, it's uh, probably it's uh, huge. Then that's why that they are uh, developing uh, such kind of algorithms. But anyway, the, and that each uh, each uh, each library have a uh, scikit wrappers. So just installed uh, pip and Python, and just uh, use uh, as in the so in the same way as the the other algorithms. So here is some code example, but I will skip the details. So if you are interested in the uh, actually using the uh, tree ensemble implementation, uh, this uh, code example will help you. Okay, we need to uh, have a parameter tuning, but the, you uh, already learned this idea from the last week's lecture. So yeah, this is uh, one example. So uh, takeaway, main takeaway for part two is uh, we have uh, two different way for uh, tree ensemble, and one is a random type, and the other is optimized type. And so, just small remark is that we can so now current implementation like uh, LightGBM or XGBoost have a, a randomized type option, so we can do subsampling, sub uh, sub uh, variable subsampling uh, with the uh, gradient descent update. So this is our first remark. And the second one is, uh, I will skip the some re research we have a discussion, but the, still we need somehow control the model complexity, the entire uh, tree ensemble. And there is a many methods developed for this one, but there is a no uh, single widely used algorithm for it. So this is a kind of a for uh, research level for now. But anyway, there is a uh, many methods uh, Developed and uh, but basic uh, basic strategy, the practical situation is that basically we, we need to uh, tune the hyperparameter directly, like max steps, max leaf nodes, uh, minimum number of sample in leaves, or something like that. So, if we want to avoid this manual tuning, then the some uh, more advanced algorithm is available. So, this is just a comment. So, last we have a uh, I don't know, five, five minutes. So I will just briefly mention about the practical data analysis problem. If we want to use the decision tree ensemble in a realistic situation, the basically <clears throat> those problems is our visualization and the hyperparameter tuning and the model interpretation and the uncertainty quantification. So this is, uh, I think uh, this should be the one another lecture. So uh, this is just a, Brief showcase, but the, I will cover it uh, quickly. So first one is a visualization, and uh, I use the live. I use this library called D3Vs uh, all through the, my lectures. So the fancy uh, decision tree output is uh, made by this library. So if you are uh, using the decision tree to understand the data sets that you have, then you can use this kind of visualization. So the manually checking the uh, data set we have is a very important to build our, our good predictable model, even for uh, deep learning. So this is a very important uh, tool for uh, actual, actual <coughs> cases. And then another one is uh, model tuning, so hyperparameter tuning. And uh, basically in the last 
or the first day lecture covers the hyperparameter tuning by Sami. <clears throat> but anyway, the for vision tree cases, there is a main parameter to be tuned. And also, as I said in the last lectures, we can use some uh, random search or grid search. And uh, but <clears throat> if we want a more uh, effective method, we have the hyperparameter tuner, like Optuner, uh, SMAC, HyperOpt, and the Psychic HyperBand, or a bunch of other algorithms. The famous one is probably Optina and HyperOpt, but uh, recently probably Optina is widely used. And anyway, this is a, a clever version of a random search CV. Random search CV is a just randomly trial, or put a run, uh, just trial a random point uh, of the defined grid, but the Optina is more cleverly, so during the uh, during the uh, search, they build some algorithms to predict which way is uh, more promising. So that's the obtainer. And uh, here is a very uh, typical example for using the obtainer to tune the uh, light GBM regressor. So if you are, <clears throat> are interested in this, uh, please uh, check out this code. So this is a um, model tuning. So another problem is uh, model interpretation. And this is uh, one of the main uh, requests in many practical situations. We want to know something informative about our data sets. Uh, so not just prediction, uh, but we want to some, somehow to understand the data sets or some trend behind the uh, data sets. And, uh, but this is a, uh, very uh, controversial topic. So, because uh, we have uh, many uh, interpolatable machine learning algorithms developed, and then, then if we apply a different algorithm to the same data sets, then the outcome interpretation is very different. So it's not uh, trivial how to manage this kind of a uh, much uh, much of the outcome, and also uh, for the same data sets, we can we can build a. Uh, uh, equally good machine learning models. So many, many machine learning models. So deep learning, decision trees, or some other method, the, the test accuracy is almost same. But then the, if we apply the interpretation algorithm to this one, then the interpretation outcome is very different. So it's very uh, not clear how to manage this interpretation problem. But uh, historically, uh, decision trees come with uh, two, uh, three, a widely used method for interpretation. So it's a, a feature importance or variable importance and a PDP, partial dependency breadth and a, a sharp, so sharply additive explanation. And but I will skip this part. So if, if you have a question about this one, please email me later. But anyway, the feature importance is, uh, outcome is something like this one. So which, uh, which variables was important to, uh, or which, Variable is um, most contributing to the good prediction. And we can uh, we can get some score for each variables, and then there is a two major method MDI and PFI. And basically, we should use basically we should use PFI over the MDI. So, and so the next one is a PDP. The PD the Feature importance just evaluates the importance of the features, but the PDP is more direct. So uh, it's, a, it's a plot of uh, empirical mean of the changes in output value. So which means that if we change the, for example, if we change the uh, value of the second, second variables, then we can see the how the outputs, average output will be changed. So in this case, for example, these variables, if 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 we have the larger value for these uh, variables, outputs uh, values will go also uh, linearly uh, increases. So we can get some intuition of the uh, machine learning model we have. So this is a PDP, and the last one is the SHAP, and this is the uh, and uh, basically the, we have a very good implementation for SHAP here. So check out uh, this uh, GitHub uh, repository and the, there is a very beautiful documentation on his own. But I, I will just uh, uh, explain the concept. So uh, SHAP is a basically try to decompose of the 
predicted value here. So this person have a, a annual salary of uh, 10 million yen, but the data set average of a Japanese company's uh, working person is was, uh, for example, 5 million. Then the what makes this person uh, salary is get higher. And uh, there is a very uh, difference between the data set average and the, this single individual uh, values. And then the chef decompose this uh, difference into the sum of the sum uh, contribution. So there are probably a positive reason, positive factors and also negative factors. So sum up of the, these factors. So this is a, and there is a very famous paper or a very good paper. And I think that there is also archive version of this. This journal is a commercial, but uh, there is an archive version. So please check out uh, how to use this uh, library. So this is a sharp value in the last free free, uh, the uh, uncertain quantification. So, oh. so what we want is uh, not just predicted values, we also need to some uh, confidence interval or uh, how to say it, uh, uncertainty variance for each prediction like this one. And uh, for this, uh, yeah, we can use the, yeah, this algorithms. So we can, we can have the, there, if we use the addition tree algorithms, there is a very good way to construct this kind of uh, uh, calculate the prediction volumes. So uh, not only have the predicted values, we can also know the prediction variance. And that it is very useful to visualize or some search for, I don't know, uh, for the new samples. And uh, there is a, a set of algorithms called the conform, uh, conformal predictions. And, uh, this is uh, based on the kind of uh, leave and out types, but the, there is a very principled way to evaluate the, uh, the uncertainty here. So. This is a quick summary for part two. And I free any question I'm here for minutes. Any questions? <laughs> okay. Image analysis. Yeah, yeah. It is a quite, uh, actually the, there is a book for from the Microsoft and that is a, this is forest for image analysis or something. And for example, Microsoft developed a decision tree ensemble for their Xbox games. Um, the Xbox games are basically uh, images. So somehow we can use the uh, decision tree for images. But the, uh, nowadays, probably I think a deep learning was, will be the first choice for image analysis if we have uh, uh, enough number of data sets. So it depends on the uh, training data size we have. Aha, uh -huh. uh, yeah, I did not mention about that, but uh, yeah, for streaming situation, there is a very different set of algorithms for decision tree learning. But there is a, a Java library for specifically developed for that one, but uh, yeah, it's uh, very different because uh, we can build a decision tree, but the, also we can somehow uh, cut out the already uh, acquired part because the stream is, is uh, changes gradually. So this is not directly applicable to the stream situation, but the, some variation of this one is already developed. So, so any other questions? Okay, so it's now time for ending. So thank you very much.